Hello, everyone. This is the Mental Insights Podcast with your host, Brennan Catulli. The Mental Insights Podcast will provide resources in the fields of mental health, drug addiction, and homelessness. This episode brings to you an interview with Joe Mincer, a man dedicated to leading others through drug addiction and life's challenges. Please enjoy this interview with a remarkable man on a mission to leave a positive footprint in society. Welcome to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is your host, Brendan Catulli, and we are here with Joe Minster to speak about mental health, drug addiction, and I'm really looking forward to what you have to provide today. So, Joe, give a quick introduction about yourself and what you're currently doing right now. Well, first off, thanks for having me on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Um, Right now, uh, well, a little bit about myself. I have uh, been through about 10 to 11. One of them doesn't really count as a rehab facility in my, in my time of addiction. I was addicted to drugs, alcohol for over 27 years. Um, I started out with uh, crack cocaine at age 13 and then progressed on to a heavy alcohol addiction later on in life. And uh, right now, what I'm currently working on is trying to take the knowledge that I learned over my addiction period and how I got sober and help to build a program for recovering addicts that are six months or more into recovery, have a general sense of community and environment where they can practice meditation and also work through some of their issues one-on-one with other members of the program in a fitness-based, spirituality-based, outdoor activity-based recovery program called the Sporadic Warrior Project. That is wonderful, Joe. So the Sporadic Warrior Project we'll speak about uh, in a little bit. But first of all, I just want to say how much it speaks, how much volume it speaks about who you are as a person to go through these type of issues and this struggle and create some beauty out of it. So I really have to commend you for that. But first of all, let's just let's bring it back uh, a second and just kind of speak about how really did drugs play a role into your life and how how did that kind of influence your own mental health as a child growing up? Well, as far back as I can remember, um, there was a lack of self-worth in my life that developed at a very young age. I was a late sprouter. So by that, I mean, I didn't grow. I'm currently 6'4". I didn't grow from the height I was at, which is right around 4'6 to 4'9 until I was 16. So I was, uh, I had the weight of a 6'4 man at the height of a 4'11 man or a 4'9 man, wherever I was at at that time. So I was, I was a little overweight and I was teased heavily for it, uh, which led me to try and find anything I could to dull that sort of pain. And it, when I was very young, it, it was a, uh, a fighting thing. I would fight in order to get past it. And then when I was introduced to drugs, it overpowered that and got me into a different form of dealing with it from that point on in life. Uh, this continued on through high school, uh, experimenting with a bunch of different drugs and um, moving into you know, early adulthood and then into 21 to 28 uh, until eventually I realized after a massive panic attack uh, where I tried to calm it down with two bottles of vodka that uh, this was not going to work anymore and ended up in the hospital with a, a pulse rate of 149 beats per minute that they couldn't calm down. And uh, at, at that point, it felt like the walls were closing in. I realized that there was a need for a change and, and I, I started to try and figure out how that was going to work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Joe. And you know, I want to bring it back to kind of those you were saying you kind of felt like you were getting a sign of how you needed to create this change. Why don't you speak about that more of how, you know, I think a lot of times when it comes to mental health or drug addiction, that usually it's a kind of a spark and a change, whether it's through 
a negative experience or it's simply the flip of the switch within your head that's telling you oh constantly like i need to get out of this place and i need to do whatever i can to get out of here so why don't you speak more about how that kind of trigger and switch created that that knowledge and awareness that you needed the help that you uh wanted to seek out i guess the first thing to say is that there people always want to attribute um your awakening moment to one experience for me that was across a multitude of experiences um i knew from the first time i went into an aa meeting and surrendered myself that i had a massive issue and that changed my outlook on my life and i knew that changes needed to be made at that point now that was at 23 years old um and or around there anyway um and at that point i knew that what i was doing was not normal but up until that point what i thought was going on in my life was just normal partying um i was like ah people do drugs people party this is the environment i surrounded myself in right everybody i knew did this so to me it seemed completely normal and um i think it's very important to point out because people from the outside look at drug users as, oh my God, how could you live like that? What you don't understand is that's their environment. That's, that's what they live in. That's where I lived. You, you live through your environment. So if your environment is only people using drugs and alcohol 24 seven, seven days, a week, you know, all year round, that is normal to you. Uh, almost as if your father told you that the color blue was purple your entire life, you would always think of it that way. Um, there was a point, uh, the first turning point that I had that came through was right around age 26 and I was in a rehab facility in Ocala, Florida and through some, uh, misconfusion of, um, circumstances, I still had a drug in my system when I went into the rehab facility, uh, that they'd used to calm me down in the hospital called Ativan. And Ativan has a very long half-life, so you still uh, test positive for it two weeks after you've taken it. So they kicked me out, or they were going to kick me out, and I left. Uh, and I started walking in the middle of nowhere, nothing to the right or left for 10 miles in each direction. It's freezing cold in Florida, which is a rare thing, but it actually was cold that night. Um, I'm walking north on a road which name i can't remember it's pitch black there's like a car every 10 minutes or so i'm trying to hitchhike and get a ride where i'm going i finally make it to uh Publix, which is a grocery store in florida to wait on a money order that a friend of mine named manny had sent to me um and as i'm waiting there i called my my aunt who had put me in the rehab in florida and i was telling her what was going on and uh she said that uh, you're cut off completely from the family. Like I warned you that if you walked out of that rehab, you were cut off completely from the family. And I tried to help her understand why I left. And it, but see, it didn't matter because nobody believes you at that point because you've lied to everybody in your life. So they have no reason to trust you. So she cut, she cut me off completely. And that was the first time in my life that I had nobody to fall back on. Not my mother, not my father, not my aunt. There was nobody I could call for 20 bucks. There was no place I could stay. I was literally on the street with nothing, with no idea where to do. So I called my best friend, Manny, which was a last resort to send me some cash. God intervened and, uh, and stopped the money order from coming through. It never made it. I waited there for six hours for that money order to come through. It never went through. Um, there is a strange thing that comes over you when you realize the way that you view your life is not a reality. And when that comes into your consciousness, it scares the shit out of you. So that was the first point of awakening for me was right there. I ended up having to call the cops on myself and put a 72 hour hold on myself which is called a baker act in florida in order to have a place to sleep for the night um 
that's the first time I had an awakening. The second time I had an awakening, uh, was some years later, uh, in, in, in Chicago where someone who was not actually using drugs in my house came to stay at my house and died in the house from an OD when I was out in another area picking up drugs. And at that point I looked at it when I came back and I was like, that's it. I've got to, I've got to change. Um, but I didn't because it was addicted and I went right back out and nothing worked. Um, fast forward years later, uh, finally I had the nervous breakdown. I end up in the hospital. I'm at a job that I hate. I get out. I'm like, what am I going to do? Um, I, you know, I called my aunt up. My aunt actually flew out to where I was at, uh, in Denver at the time. She flies out there. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, something's got to change. Um, I said, how do I work through this? She said, you have to fix whatever's in your head that makes you feel you're so unworthy and such a bad person that you can't get past this. So I started doing a lot of self-work. I started, I, I took some courses. I took a course called Insight um, in, in California. I started meditating every day. I started hitting the gym every day because the boredom is the worst thing for an addict. Um, I stopped referring to myself as an addict. I stopped calling myself. I stopped saying I am an addict. I am an alcoholic. Why? Why would I do that? You know, every, every, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, they have you repeat that over and over again. The reason I didn't do that was I thought to myself, all the stuff that I'm learning is how to build an affirmation that begins with I am and something positive after it. Why would I put such a negative connotation after that of addict or alcoholic when I could put something like, I am able to achieve my goals. I am a successful, I'm a successful person. I am a kind hearted person. I am a loving and generous person. This is how I start my day nowadays. All of this started with a simple choice to begin meditating and move forward into that, into that area. And once you expand your consciousness in just the slightest way, then you're open to other things and other things. And then you start learning about yourself and you start working. And let me tell you, it's not easy at all. It's very hard to dig into your past, into everything that has ever set you off in life and work through it and find out where you're accountable for that action. And most people, most people won't do it. It's scary. I learn something about myself every day. Um, most recently um, was yesterday. Uh, and um, I found out that I had a pattern that went back to childhood when I was three years old. And I realized how to correct it. That is life changing. When you find something about yourself that you have put that causes you to get into bad situations all the time. And it's recognized. It's a pattern. You know, it's a pattern. Now you can fix it. Now you can move forward. Now you can love yourself more because that's where the basis of your life begins is loving yourself. That's incredible, Joe. I, I really appreciate all that you've just shared. And there's a lot that I want to unpack with uh, what you just said. But first, before we speak about meditation and talking about this true awakening and how you really have become your true self in loving yourself and appreciating yourself, I just want to quickly speak about the resources that you were able to seek out when you were going through these struggles just so our audience can hear more about truly what is available and how they could go through the process of seeking any sort of help so if you could just speak more about aa and seeking rehab just give your own personal quick experience of how accepting the facilities are and how helpful they can be if you do need that help. I would say the first place to always start is with surrender. However you want to complete that surrender is, is epically necessary. For me, it was AA. For, um, some people are not a fan of AA or NA or the, or the 12 step programs. That's fine. There's a million other programs out there where you can go in and surrender. And at that first time that you stand up and say those words, something switches in your head. 
and and it's a place of like oh my god what the hell how did i not see this and then it, it, it switches to you know how can i fix it so i would 